Hey, welcome back, and thank you for joining us. Today, we have a very special guest, Dr. Morag Kersel. She is professor of archaeology at DePaul University in the Department of Anthropology. Morag, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thanks for the invite. I'm really happy to be here. Hi, everybody. Uh, I have always enjoyed uh, reading what you write, uh, following your excavations, <laughs> especially since you kind of became one of the world's experts on the antiquities trade. Uh, not that that's what you wanted to become, but you you <laughs> you became you became one of the people following this and studying this. And as this is something that has been in the news and and continues to be in the news for better and for worse. Uh, I thought uh, it would be great to interview you. I really appreciate uh, you taking the time with us today. Well, I'm delighted to be here, and thank you very much for that generous description. I'm not sure I'm one of the leading experts, but I'm definitely someone who looks a lot at why people buy artifacts and how they go from the ground to the consumer. You uh, recently came to the University of Iowa, so thank you. We will desperately try to get you some better weather <laughs> next time you come. <laughs> Uh, for those of you who weren't aware, and I'll put the description uh, for the talk here in case you missed it, uh, Morag came to the University of Iowa to give a talk and then got snowed in. We, we had this massive snowstorm that people read about across the nation, and she basically got stuck here. We went out to dinner and then <laughs> had to come give your talk, and you ended up giving it uh, in isolation, I think. That's right. From the inside of my hotel room, I saw a lot of that, which was very nice. <laughs> I'm sorry I didn't see more of uh, Iowa City and yeah. uh, all of you, but I will do a repeat visit. Uh, it was fabulous. Yeah, we'll have, to, <laughs> we'll have to bring you back. Yeah, that's that's right. Um, how did you become an archaeologist? How, do, how does one, for those <clears> watching, how does one become an archaeologist? So it's a great question. My students always ask this and they love it when you tell the story of how you became, you know, how you got where you are today. We do a segment on my anthropological life and um, we talk, you know, I have people zoom in and talk about this. Um, I am from a tiny town in Southern Ontario and our big trip as school kids was to go to the Royal Ontario Museum in um, Toronto. And I know that it was in the halls of the Royal Ontario Museum. I fell in love with the Greeks and the Romans and the Egyptians and became obsessed with, um, you know, all things historical. And then I had a high school teacher who was also a neighbor who was a classicist and he nurtured my interest in archaeology. And then I went on to study archaeology and classics as an undergrad, and then I did um, graduate work at the University of Toronto in Near Eastern Archaeology. And then I did a PhD in it, and now I have a job. And I have always, and in between, I should say that for three years, I was a contractor with the U.S. Department of State in their cultural heritage office. And I loved the work I was doing there, and I felt like it was meaningful. But, you know, I'm a field archaeologist, and I really missed going into the field and walking landscape or digging. And so I then, that's when I decided to go back to school and do a PhD. So I was a later-in-life PhD. And that's how I became an archaeologist and how I have remained one my entire life. So you've wanted to do this since you were young. You've studied it. You became a professor, which is increasingly difficult to find a to find a yeah. job in the profession. You're a field archaeologist. You're at DePaul University, which I love the University of Iowa, but DePaul is close to my heart because my daughter Tally uh, has her degree from from DePaul. Uh, and you also not only are you teaching and uh, doing field work, but you have uh, another project called Follow the Pots. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about Follow the Pots and, and how that feeds into your your current research? Yeah. Um, so as anyone will tell you, I'm, well, in addition to talking with my hands, I'm also um, someone who gets obsessed with things. And so I, and this is a great story, um, was in the Heathrow Airport and I was reaching for a book at of W.H. Smith, and someone else was reaching for the same book, and it turned out to be Meredith Chesson, who is an early Bronze Age specialist from the University of Notre Dame. And we both had five hours to kill waiting for our respective flights, and so we sat down and started talking, and we arrived at this research project, 
where she had been looking at the cities of the plain along the Dead Sea, places mm -hmm. like Numera and um, Babadra and Safi. And we they've been heavily looted. They are both mortuary and um, domestic sites, and people have been looting the graves since about the 60s. And so we started talking about what we could do to help Jordanians and work with our um, Jordanian colleagues to protect the sites, but also to track where the pots were now. And so we started delving into archives, working with Nancy Lath, who was a person who worked for years in the area with her husband, Paul. And we realized that in the 70s, ASOR and the Department of Antiquities in Jordan decided to sell off 24 tomb groups from Baba Dra in order to create space in their um, storage facilities, but also to give small seminaries access to collections from Jordan. The Jordanian government thought these artifacts would act as ambassadors. So we now are tracking those pots to figure out where they are and if they're in the same place or if they're in some, you know, if they've been sold on. Because one of the arguments that um, archaeologists and other people will make about the commodification of the past is we shouldn't sell these things because technologies change and 20 years from now, you know, a residue analysis might be different. And we're if we wanted to study those pots, how would we find them? Mm -hmm. So we can say now we have tracked 22 of the tomb groups and they are in the same place they were when they were sold 40 years ago. So if you wanted to go back and study them, you could. Some of them are still on display and some of them, and the two groups we haven't tracked yet, I'm still in the process of um, tracking them down. But uh, the website, followthepotsproject.org, it's pretty robust and you can see the pots that we're talking about and as part of this project, I've also been interviewing people who are buying them today because really? in Israel, it's legal to buy and sell antiquities, right? Yeah. And I know this, right? Yeah. And we've been in the old city and there are a number of licensed shops that are licensed by the state of Israel and over the oversight falls on the Israeli Antiquities Authority, our good friends there. Mm -hmm. um, but under the law, nothing new should be entering the market but there are new things entering the market. And so part of my PhD research was to figure out how that was happening. And that's through a series of interviews with people, collectors, dealers, looters, buyers. And so for the last 10 years, I've really focused on people buying antiquities, why they wanna own them. And included in these antiquities are these pots because everyone, and this is a direct quote, wants a pot from the city of Sin because Baba Dra <laughs> has been identified tentatively as biblical Sodom. But as you and I both know, there's more than one Sodom out there. Right. And That's we've right. also never found a sign saying, this is Sodom here. And right. so, but the prevailing sentiment is you can get a pot from the city of Sin. That's right. So sin, uh, Sodom is a popular place. Uh, and so yeah. there's, there's <laughs> lots of them. And I, I, I want to come back to this question about why people want to buy artifacts still to this day. I mean, mm -hmm. we know that it creates a problem and, you know, with, with looting and, and forgeries, but I want to come back to this, this question, but you have a partner and I don't, it's not just a, a research mm -hmm. partner, but this is a, a very close partner uh, for you. Your, your partner, York Rowan over at the University of Chicago, a scholar over there is also an archeologist. So you are married to an archaeologist. How does that work? Uh, and how did you guys meet? And uh, how did how did you end up married to another archaeologist? Oh, well, it's a great question. Um, I am married to York Rowan and we co-direct the Galilee Prehistory Project where we're investigating the Calcolithic period in the Galilee, which is a period that's very understudied um, and usually found as a result of rescue salvage excavation. So we are doing systematic research. We met at Shikmin in 1989. And I know there'll be people out there who are Shikmin survivors, because there's a whole <laughs> group of us. Um, that was one of the most, um, what we, we refer to commonly in our household as extreme archeology, span where there's no running water and the food is out of cans and it's not that great. And let me just say, if you can meet someone and fall in love under those conditions, 30 years later, and this is our 30th 
anniversary in congratulations, June. Congratulations, <laughs> congratulations. You, you can be married to them forever and still go on extreme archaeology projects because now we have our own extreme archaeology project in Jordan. Um, so we met on that day. I had just finished my undergraduate and uh, York was a graduate student at the University of Texas at Austin. And we met and we got married a couple of years later. And then I moved to Austin. And then we've continued to collaborate and work together on various projects. And usually we have busman's holidays, right? Where we don't really go on holiday. Like we went to the Holy Land experience in Florida. Oh, and awesome. York wrote, yeah, and you wrote a paper on it while we were there. <laughs> so, and then we also went to mini Israel. And if you've never been to mini Israel, highly recommend it. We also wrote a paper on that. So um, usually our off time is also investigating archeology span or, you know, some other kind of phenomenon. Yeah, I I get in trouble. I do this as well. On on, <laughs> on my vacations, I try to do these working research vacations. The problem is, Rosalind is not an archaeologist, <laughs> and she would rather lie on a beach and just you know not go trotting from museum to museum. She loves museums. She loves doing that, just not on vacation. She would like right. to you know just enjoy sipping an adult beverage and and just relaxing. <laughs> so, so congratulations on thirty years. Thank you. Um, uh, that's. Um, I know it, quite a feat. <laughs> it, it, it is. It is. You you mentioned following pots. You mentioned getting into this research because of your work in the, in field archaeology, uh, doing all kinds of research. But it kept coming back to trade, right? It kept coming mm -hmm. back to these antiquities that. You wanted the ability, and I think this is a brilliant project, right? You wanted the ability to track antiquities so that you could at least research them. Why is it that everybody who goes to Israel, and by the way, is it legal to trade antiquities in other countries in Southwest Asia and the Eastern Mediterranean other than Israel? It's not. Um, Israel is sort of this, well, I shouldn't say that. It is uh, in Dubai, has become another central sort of node. But in Israel, is um, one of the only countries left in the region where you can still legally buy and sell antiquities and export them. So if you and I went into the shop and purchased an artifact, we would ask for an export license and then we could legally take it out of the country because the dealer would ask the Antiquities Authority to issue the export license. So um, it's one of the only countries where this is legal, but there are systems in place that are long entrenched that allow for laundering of looted stuff. Stuff looted yesterday can enter the market. Um, and despite the best efforts of border customs control, inter, you know, um, cooperation between Jordan and Israel and Israel and other Egypt, um, Illegal things from other countries are still entering that market and available for sale. And so it's it's not a, I don't want to call it a big black hole, but part of the problem is that Israel is not a signatory to the 1970 UNESCO Convention against the illegal import-export of artifacts. And so most other countries in the region are, and that means they respect each other's um import export laws but israel because they're not a signatory doesn't really do that they enter into bilateral agreements or um, no agreement at all and they just rely on people checking their borders and making sure that things aren't coming illegally but you know artifacts travel in the same circle as trafficking people guns drugs and so there are really good networks in place and things can move around a lot and so that's been you know the some total of my last 20 years, that research part of my life is to figure out how these things go from the ground to someone like my mom, who's in the old city on a pilgrimage, buying an oil lamp. Um, right. And then, you know, the different nodes they pass through and how many hands they pass through and how they end up legally available for sale. Because by the time you and I go into the shop in Jerusalem, there's nothing illegal it's already right. legal and you and I are not doing anything illegal. The right. illegal part has already happened. Right. And that's important to to remind people when they yeah. go into the shop and, you know, these shops have licenses. These are licensed dealers. This is legal in Israel. Mm -hmm. And so when they go into the shop, it's not like they're doing something illegal, right? This is a completely <laughs> legal thing. But and so, you know, we we could use the term laundered, right? But the, these these pots have been basically made legal. 
yep. in a sense. So I guess the question is, you you know, we mentioned that they they travel in the same circle as drugs and you know smuggling you know people and 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 trafficking people and, but in in many of those cases, drugs you know there there's an addiction involved and people need to have it and so there's a if there's a demand for it then there's a then there's somebody who will always produce this even if it's illegal. Why do people want these antiquities? What what's the driving force behind uh, the illegal trade of antiquities? What what's what's driving the demand for them? Right. So this has been really my obsession for the last five years, and this is why I have to um, draw this research to not to a complete close, but I have to do less of it. Because anybody who's at the Albright or York will tell you, like, that's all I talk about. Like, I go out into the old city every day and I ask people like my mom, your mom, um, what'd you buy today? And, you know, all of my research is covered under ethical review protocol. And so I go through the whole, like, I'm more a cursal researcher. This is the research I'm doing. This is what I'm going to do with the data. Will you agree to talk to me? And, you know, everybody likes to talk about themselves. So. <laughs> Uh, over 200 interviews later, people like to own these things, and I am only speaking about Holy Land antiquities. The reason somebody wants a moche pot from somewhere in Central or South America is maybe different than Holy Land experience, right? So everybody in the Holy Land who's buying a pot wants or believes that they are buying something that someone from the Bible has either held, been in contact with, or it's from a site, an important site. So there's this tangible reminder of the religion, whatever your faith, mm -hmm. that you then take home, put on your mantle, and can relive when someone comes to your house and asks you about that unusual thing on your shelf. And you can tell them about the hot day in the old city where you bartered, you drank tea and then you bartered with the guy dressed like a Bedouin and you had this authentic experience and you purchased something from the year zero that Jesus might have been in touch with. Right. So so it's it's about reliving the experience. It's about it's a piece of history. So it's about your own personal experience overseas, but it's also something to do with is it a confirmation of faith or at least a believed confirmation of faith? Or is it something to do about the history? So it, maybe it's not something of uh, an apologetic sense, but maybe it's something to do with the history of the world in which your faith was born. Something It has something to do. There's a faith aspect to a lot of it, correct? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, there's some really great work out there. I mean, I was only looking at people buying antiquities, but there have been researchers like Hillary Kale from McGill and um, Shelley Shenhop uh, Keller who have looked at people buying, you know, talismans or vials of um, sand and water from the Holy Land. Um, and in one of those um, studies, there's this great piece about this buyer named Wendy, who instead of going with her group to the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, went to a shop to buy artifacts to bring back to people from her um, uh, church because mm -hmm. she felt that she was their emissary or their representative. And really? she had to bring back not just the memories of going to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, but the physical reminder of the visit to the Holy Land because some of them couldn't couldn't go for whatever reason. So she had to bring this stuff back. There's some really great studies out there by um, religion professors and um, also James Bilo, who's been looking at materializing the Bible and mm -hmm. what people are buying and selling um, on eBay. It's so interesting. So, so in many regards, it's like a pilgrimage. People are making a pilgrimage and this piece of history that articulates their faith or confirms their faith, at least in, in their eyes, is not only something for them, but for many people, they're acting as an emissary. A, 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 it's a pilgrimage by proxy for people back home as well. Which is exactly what you got. And I'm no expert in this. There are other people, but with the um, Crusades and earlier, you know, people, pilgrims to the Holy Land from the early centuries who were also buying things and taking them home because nobody, you know, very few people could make the trip. 
But that's why you get all these relics in these churches all over Europe, because then there's the finger bone of so-and-so or the piece of the true cross in, in whatever church that people can visit. And it's all by proxy, right? Because they're never going to get to the Holy Land, but they can have that experience because here's a piece of the Holy Land in their church or in their home. And and more people will come to a local cathedral or parish or you know they'll come to a local church in France or in, you know, in some local place in Europe. And that does what? That raises the attendance, that raises the faithfulness, the within the local European Christian community, if they've got an artifact or a believed relic back in the in the home region. Yeah. And I also think it just um, is a continuation of the faith, right? right? Like if you have this actual piece that people can visit, especially if it's a particular saint that's been identified with your relic and it's that saint day and you get people pouring into these um, venues to venerate the saint, the saint um, regardless of whether, you know, how religious they are or aren't, it's now become the standard practice, which is also true of people buying in the Holy Land. Right. So you get an itinerary, you sign up to go on a group tour, you get an itinerary and you're going to go on the Via Dolorosa. You're going to stop at all the stations of the cross. You're going to end up at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Then you're going to go to the Mount of Olives, you're, you know, and as part of that entire process, you're also going to buy an artifact. Right. That's going to be like right. everyone is going to buy an artifact, whether it's a Russian icon, a widow's mite coin. Um, you know, one of those tear catchers, which are also super popular, right. or an oil lamp or whatever, you're all going to buy one. And the reason I um, am pretty emphatic about the tie to the, the land and religion is that one of the questions I ask everyone is if they would buy a replica. Because there are a lot of replicas mm -hmm. in the stores, whether the store is licensed or not. And people are not trying to pass them off as the real thing. Right. You know, you pay $2 and you buy an oil lamp. I'm sure you have some at home. I have some, mm -hmm. right? There are very few people who will buy a replica, even though they're made in Hebron. They're made in the Holy right. Land. They right. don't want a replica because there's no way anyone from the Bible or the site from the Bible is associated with that replica which I early on found fascinating. Like I asked one person and they said no. And then I asked a couple other people and they said no. And then I started to think, is everyone going to say no? Is everyone wholesale going to say they don't want a replica? And it's pretty much, yeah, they don't want a replica. I, I have found this uh, uh, a fascinating trend with safaris as well. When people go on safaris, there are the people who want to go over you know, to Africa and kill animals so that they can bring home the, and then, you know, I say, go over and bring a camera, take photos, take photos of these things and you bring home. Yeah. It's, it's just a facsimile. It's just a photo, but you're still having this experience. You're still having the majesty uh, of this, of this, you know, seeing these animals you're, you, and you have this memory of it. You don't have to kill the animal and cut its head off and put the head on the wall and bring it home. But it, there's something about, for some people, there's something mm -hmm. about having the authentic thing, having the real thing, even though there's going to be a tremendous price paid. And I guess that's the next question is, if these people are willing to spend money so that they can have this religious experience, and that's what it is, so they can bring it back home and relive this religious experience, they have uh, something authentic from the Holy Land. Does that not mean that there's a tremendous amount of money to be made by by trading in these antiquities? And what problems does that cause on the other end? Right. So because the majority of the market are the low end buyers uh, who buy a, an oil lamp or a small pot, that means that the sites where I work at in Jordan along the Dead Sea Plain get looted, right? Because people there in their tombs are buried with, you know, six and 30 pots and the looters know this. And there's a complex system of um, movement where the artifacts get looted and then they end up for sale legally available in Israel. Because under the 1978 Israeli law that makes it legal to sell antiquities, they're actually, the supply should be drying up, but it's not because nothing new should be entering that market, but it is through this weird exchange of registry numbers that um, involves 
the onus on the buyer or the tourist to know that they need to ask for the export license. So if they don't ask for the export license, the number can this the individual number assigned to each pot can be reused for another buff colored pot. Really? So, yeah. So that's in the end what happens is that looters in Jordan know that someone's going to buy their pot for between four and seven dollars, and then it's going to pass through a series of hands, cross a border, and end up legally available for sale in Israel where you and I would buy it unsuspectingly and not know that we were buying something that was looted yesterday. But ultimately, the demand drives the destruction back at these sites, right? So so the demand, so us, you know, an un unwitting person, a person of faith wants to come yep. in and buy an authentic piece, but they're unknowingly, perhaps knowingly, but probably unknowingly, promoting or, or at least driving the looting of legitimate archaeological sites all throughout Southwest Asia, all throughout Israel and Jordan and Egypt and, and Syria, right? They're, they're driving the looting of it because these pots have to come from somewhere. That's right. And one of the other issues with the law is this weird quirk where it's on us, the buyer, to know that we need to ask for the export license. The dealer doesn't have to offer you one. Really? So if you don't know that, and it's not in any of the guidebooks, it's only in one guidebook that's out of print, you wouldn't, you you would think you were only doing something, you were completely above board and legal because you're in a licensed shop, and why wouldn't you? And so if you don't ask for the export license, that's how this, you know, new material can enter the market. And so wow. it's a really um, unfair and a disadvantage to the buyer when in fact, what, well, Ultimately, we could close that loop a little more if we had buyers who asked more questions. Right. Like, so where did that piece come from? How long has it been out of the ground? How long has it been in your family's collection? Do you have the backstory of the owner history? So what we need are, you know, better collectors. Right. Because right. I'm not here to shut down the trade. I'm not Israeli. I'm not Palestinian. I don't make the rules. I'm just here to make it I, as an archaeologist would i love to see less looting absolutely right. but um you know people have been buying and selling antiquities from this region and the trade and relics has been going on for millennia i think it's unlikely we're going to stop it in the next 10 years um and i think it's naive to think that but we could definitely create a better set of collectors especially right. another loophole or with the tour guides right who also may or may not tell their um the people on their tour that they should ask for an export license and or at the tourist information shop at Jaffa Gate. They absolutely should be telling people if you're going to buy antiquities, look for the license prominently displayed and ask for an export license. And they wow. don't and they don't do that. They don't do that. They don't always do that, I should say. Yeah, yeah. right. Is there a reason, and I think I know the answer, but is there a reason why the Israeli government doesn't just say okay, no more antiquities trade. Is it because it's such a lucrative industry top to bottom on the legal side for everyone involved and that just would never, it's a democracy and it just would never get voted through? I would say that's probably true. You know, this is a really sticky point that not many people in my 20 years of doing this research want to talk about. Um, because one of the questions we might ask ourselves is why in 1978, when almost all the other countries are passing these national ownership laws where it bans the trade in antiquities, did Israel keep a trade? You know, there are right. so few of them in the world. Why did they do this? Well, you have this great, um, perfect storm of Teddy Kolak as the mayor of Jerusalem at the same time that Moshe Dayan is in the Knesset, and both of them are huge collectors of antiquities. Oh, really? And so they want to see it continue. That coupled with dealers at the time, you know, there were both Israeli and Palestinian dealers. And so there was this, you know, right to free enterprise and the perpetuation, you know, a ready market. You have an uptick in people visiting. And so there's money to be made, and there are people who want to buy it from the higher echelons of government, but also from the average tourist and pilgrim to the area. So it just creates this perfect moment. Um, whereas, you know, tomorrow, if you and I went to Israel and asked any one of our Israeli colleagues, should there be a trade in antiquities? 
all of them would say no. We should right. no, it should be banned. Everyone is in full agreement that it should be banned. But but that's I mean tourism is such a big part of Israel's economy huge. and and granted yeah. their economy is expanding in so many other ways. You know, the question could be asked how much would they miss the trade of antiquities, right? There's still going to be people going to the Holy Land to visit the holy sites even if they can't buy a pot or, you know, a, some something. By the way, you know, when I go over, I buy something carved out of, you know, a piece of olive wood from a tree and bring it back Maybe. to my grandmother, right? Or, you know, something from the River Jordan, r water from the River Jordan, right? This is this is fun we stuff, some olive oil, right? Yeah. yeah. These, are, these are souvenirs that don't deplete from the from the cultural heritage of 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 people i always like to find the the novelty gifts right the holy wipes the wet wipes that have been you know you know made from from the jordan river you know water from the jordan river i like those kinds of things testament i didn't know they existed I'm oh gonna yeah those. wow blessed by the pope i got one that's got you know the uh, um Pope John Paul II on it, and it's been blessed, and it's got some, you know, oh. I, I love these types of things to, to bring home and to give away as gifts, but I, I just, I, the question has to be asked, even if they did this, would there still be forgers? Would there still be people, because of the, the money that's available, as you crack down on the looting, as you crack down on the demand, would there still be people out there trying to forge for whatever well, reason, either trying to fool the scholars or trying to make money? Would there people be forging these objects? Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's a, as you and I both know, there's a thriving trade in biblical forgeries. And, you know, our colleague Chris Rolston has written extensively about it, among other people, including yourself. And so we have a lot of um, change of our, you know, chronological um evidence for this. And so it's not anything new. Um, we also, I uncovered a lot of um, selling of what are known as composites. What so are these, these? Uh, so these are artifacts that are made up of um, three or four different pieces from different broken bits, like put together and glued together and then maybe made dirty so that you can't tell that there are seams, um, but they're illegal under the law. But there are a lot of composites for sale in the market. Really? Yeah. And, uh, you know, I've had uh, people I've interviewed have told me that, that, you know, I interviewed one person. They took home their artifact. They thought it looked really dirty, so they decided to wash it and it immediately fell apart into a couple of pieces. And I told them, you know, I can give you the name of the people at the IAA that you can contact to get your money back. And they said... Oh no, it's okay. I love that guy. He, you know, he's super authentic. I'll probably buy stuff from him again, you know. And so these are the kinds of conversations I have all the time. And so it's not just fakes. There are also all these other ways that artifacts are entering the market, like through, you know, piecing things together and, and, you know, mislabeling. There've been a lot of things mislabeled right. as Herodian when they're Islamic and, you know, um, but. There are a lot more fakes on that market than I think probably I realize. And I have been in the old city with someone like Elliot Braun, who's like the leading expert in early Bronze Age, right? And if Elliot Braun can look at an artifact and say, wow, I'm not sure if that's real or not, none of us <laughs> right. should be, you know, it's a buyer beware situation. So if you want to participate in the market, you could be buying a fake and you wouldn't even know it because if Elliot okay. Braun doesn't know your early Bronze Age pots are fake, <laughs> how are you going to know? Yeah. And, you know, after after this whole nonsense with uh, this Darius inscription that, that came out, I thought it was important what Gideon Avni said yeah. there, uh, the IAA, you should only be looking at and you should only be discussing objects that come from controlled excavations right we, th this is the only thing that we should be publishing not only you know not only uh talking about this is the only thing that we should be publishing uh, i had a conversation with uh dan mcclellan recently where we talked about i find it interesting that the same publications that are criticizing the iaa for having made this announcement were very quick to publish this stuff when it first came out they knew this was an unprovenanced uh, artifact. I mean, they they told the story in the publication. They they knew it was unprovenant, and yet they rushed to publish it because they didn't want to lose the story 
to the the other paper down the street. And so by publishing this, um, by, by just by just talking about it, by giving a critical analysis of it, by it still drives the market. It, and we just should not even be publishing this stuff. If if it's announced in the popular media, let those of us in the popular media talk about why we shouldn't be talking about it, but it shouldn't be entering into these publications. This is so true. And this was never more evident to us, um, Meredith Chesson and Chad Hill and I, who work at these Dead Sea Plain sites, than um, last year in Science Reports, which is the more scientific or the shorter area, uh, shorter publication of science. Um, the folks who work at Tel Al Hammam, which is a biblical site uh, north of the in the Jordan Valley, north of the Dead Sea, that has also been tentatively identified as biblical Sodom. So the art the article is about a biblical, you know, a fire in the ground and proof, but they don't mention Sodom at all. Only in passing as to say this article is not about proving the Bible. Right. But in fact, it's enough that all of the media who picked it up was all about biblical Sodom, picking, right. you know, finding evidence for biblical Sodom. So we wrote an op-ed in reply, which was about how media like that is clickbait and ends up being looting at our site. Right. Because even though the scientists and the archaeologists from um, Hammam were not trying to prove biblical Sodom in that article, that's all the media picked up on. Right. And that means that people are going to loot at our biblical Sodom, which is the other one at Baba Dra, to look for these pots so that they can go into the market. Right. No, I, I just... I. I I remember on the excavations that I've been on at Telezeka and, and other places, mm -hmm. uh, just coming out one morning and you just see the the pock marks. And I know that there have been studies done at ASOR and and some some presentations where they're just showing the satellite images. In fact, I think one of them came from you, where you're just showing yeah. the satellite images of these of these holes that just go through and you can see where people just come out there with metal detectors and, and shovels and picks and just try to pick apart these and just completely devastate, ruin these archaeological sites. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to make it seem also like we archaeologists are not blameless because the other element of this is, um, you know, we have great satellite imagery and drone footage uh, from the site of FAPA, which is an early Bronze Age cemetery, where in 1989 was the first time that it was excavated by Tom Shubb and Walt Rast. And their presence on the landscape, you know, anytime we go out there, people in other parts of the world are like, you and I are not flying thousands of miles, paying hundreds of dollars to dig up broken bits of shirt and flint. That We're just not, there's gotta right. be gold, there's gotta be something right. else. Right. And so our presence on the landscape also um, indicates to people that there's something to be found there. Right. Even though for me, you know, at our sites in Israel, our big find, domesticated lentils, right? Like <laughs> that's what we're looking for. But, but people just don't believe that. Right. And so when we don't publish, which is our biggest failing as a discipline, and when we don't collaborate or communicate with our local communities, tell them what we're doing, right. then that also leads this like, specter of like, what are these foreigners doing and what kind of gold are they taking away? And um, so that also can uh, end up destroying landscapes as well. That's right. What other things are you working on in addition to, I, I know you didn't get into archaeology to talk <laughs> about the the illicit trade of antiquities and, you know, and, you know, I didn't get into uh, to scholarship to talk about many of the things that I end up spending a lot of time doing. But you know, you kind of go where your scholarship leads based upon your skill set and based upon the opportunities that avail them themselves to you. But what are you working on now? What are some of the research projects that you're working on? Well, a lot of my work is actually dictated by my teaching, right? Because mm -hmm. we're I'm at a teaching institution. So I teach a lot of classes and I try to combine research uh, so that students can be involved with um, the pedagogical moment. And so most recently, I have turned my attention to, I teach a lot of museum studies classes, mm -hmm. and I am interested in how we present the past to the public, especially the Near Eastern past that you and I work on. And I've been um, 
focusing my attention on these Neolithic masks that are made of limestone. We only know about 18 of them in the world. And I'm trying to figure out where they are now, where they were, and what kind of sites they come from. Because of the 18, most of them do not have a pristine archaeological origin story, uh -huh. shall we say. I'll yeah. just leave it at that. Right. Um, only a couple have been actually excavated in situ. A couple were purchased, or three or four were purchased directly from mm, farmers, not so much looters. And then a number of them were in the private collection of Michael Steinhardt. And so, and they've recently been repatriated to Israel. Right. So I'm interested in those and putting them into the larger sort of context of what we know and what we don't know about the um, Neolithic. The, uh, pre-pottery Neolithic B, which is supposedly when most of them come from. And and for our viewers here, Neolithic these Neolithic masks date to about... Sorry, uh, I should have said that from the beginning. No, it's uh, fine, it's fine. From around 7,600 to about 6,000 BCE. So these are eight, what, eight, nine millennia old? Yes, and one of the things, because we don't have pristine archaeological find spot uh, for them, we don't actually know what they were used for because they're too heavy to wear. They're made of limestone and they're heavy, but maybe they were laid on top of someone who was dead, but we don't know because we've never found one in that kind of context. So that's also, we have a lot of maybe ethnographic analogy in later societies, but we are also trying to, you know, I'm trying to figure out the backstory and um, maybe put a context for some of these. What other courses, in, in addition to the museum study courses, what do you think is your most popular course at DePaul? <laughs> what, I mean, what are the students, if, if you wanted to get all the students to come in, what, what, what's the course that they like the best that, that they will always want to come and take uh, from So you? I have a waiting list. Of, so our classes are capped at 45, and I have a waiting list of at least 45 extra people every time I offer. Anthropology 130, science and pseudoscience in archaeology, which is basically, I wanted to call it ancient aliens, but you know, the powers that be did not want to call it that, so that's fine. Um, <laughs> that class, and it's filled with non-majors, of course, and it right. fulfills, you know, a breadth requirement. I'm sure Tali had to take some of these, but right, that sure. class is so popular. People right. love it, love it. <laughs> and I will uh, be using one of your clips that you just did uh, where you uh, great gave an excellent um, description or discussion about the use of BCE and BC, which is, you know, in the early, in the first two classes, I do intro to archaeology, and then we move into how to debunk myths and the myths that are out there. And your explanation for the use of those terms was is excellent. So I'm going to switch out one of my uh, ramblings and put yours in. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. I, I, enjoyed making that one. I've been talking about that all the time. And of course, I get all the feedback from folks that are, you know, you hate Jesus, you're taking Jesus out of it. But I try to explain in that video, it's really not what I'm doing. I have wanted to offer an ancient aliens classes, having been on that show as the debunker, right? The guy right. up front where they, they always offer, uh, they always say, you know, traditional scholars and skeptics say, and then, you know, then there's this. And then I'm like, yeah, no, it's not aliens. And then they'll say, but could it possibly be? My question, you know, the, the reason that I took heat, especially when I was young, right? When I was a lot younger, I took a lot of heat for saying, why would you even go on that show? Why would you even affiliate with these guys, especially given, you know, this, this criticism and it's a, it's a valid criticism that, uh, everything that's discovered by people whose skin isn't white, uh, must have been created by aliens. And then all the stuff that, you know, took place over in Europe. I mean, it's a, this is a valid, you know, is that I was always convinced that there's an audience there that needs to hear legitimate archeology span that needs to hear real archeology, span and they're not going to take my classes. And I believe in meeting people where they are meeting people halfway. You need to talk to people that you don't agree with. And so I felt that I at least needed to go there to present what real archaeologists say, knowing that they're going to say, okay, right up front, two minutes, and then no, and then they're going to go off on some nutty theory. Uh, by the way, Ancient Aliens Live is touring. They're coming to Des Moines 
they're here in Iowa. And I thought maybe I'd go show up there and, and just maybe ask a question, but I, I think I'm just going to avoid it altogether. But I always thought it was important to go, to be on shows like that. And I get more emails from ancient aliens than any other documentary that I'm on simply from people saying, Hey, I didn't know that. Or I, I, I always thought it was this. And, and it's led to people asking me and it's led to students into my courses. So I've always wanted to offer an, you know, is it ancient aliens or something like that? I'm, I'm with you. I think if we call it that, you know, you get 200 students in a, in a lecture class and then you can talk about pseudoscience. So I might oh, just I copy, I might copy you and get to syllabus. Oh, I'll send it to you. Absolutely. And, um, and I, I also think it's a real service because there are people really who are fascinated by this, right? right? For good or bad, you know, whether they totally believe it or whether they don't really know much about it and just want to learn more. And, you know, these shows on Netflix, like the ancient apocalypse and these, yeah. you know, all these other ones that are so popular, it's really, um, it's really important. I think, and I, I think you did a real service for the discipline to go on those shows because yeah. You absolutely have to participate in these conversations or else it's just one sided, you know, right. and then then everybody just believes it was aliens or, right. you know, and they don't question things that are out there. And I think that's problematic. And I think that's how I pitch it in the class like because right. I'm not there. It's not completely OK. I realize I am pretty cynical. and I do have <laughs> my own opinions, but I do try to present it as in, right. well, here's the science. And here's how we, and we don't really even call it debunking or myth busting. We just use science to show that it couldn't, it could, couldn't possibly be aliens because this, or that's right. not really what Plato went when he was talking about Atlantis. And here's, right. so, um, I think it's, it's really important to offer a class like that because there are students who are really interested in this stuff. Yeah. That, that was always our, our argument was that they're going to hear what people, you know, the people who are going to them. And if scholars just stay in their tower and just talk to each other with their, with their articles and nobody actually reaches out to the students where they are, to the audience, the public, where they are, if they avoid the popular media, uh, then, you know, it's the same thing that's happening in politics today, right? It's mm -hmm. if, if scholars don't take it upon themselves to engage in these issues that we would call controversial uh you know it's the same thing they say to professional basketball you know shut up and dribble if they don't engage with these issues that that are relevant then that's then they're going to be irrelevant and so i think that it's 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 important that scholars are active in these issues that are relevant and that's why i think what you're doing looking at uh, this, uh, the illicit trade while you're doing your research, you're still doing your field research, but you're also dealing with this thing that's so important to so many people and trying to just ask the question, why are we doing this? Why are we still dealing in, uh, in antiquities? Well, and you know, I got into this because I wanted to know how archeological law affects the average archeologist, or if it does, or, you know, cause we all have to apply for permits. I was looking at the bigger process, but really what affects us is that every day we can see looting at our sites and wondering why, and why are people digging? And so, um, you know, I, I will say it's, it's in, in the same respect, it's been hard at some points because place people like at the Antiquities Authority, they want me to give the names of the people doing illegal things, but that's not my job as an anthropologist, right? My right. duty is to my informants and um, I can't. And so a lot of times we're at an impasse and we don't really right. talk. And so it's, you know, some, some years are better than others doing this research. Right. But that's for right. the most part, I think, you know, it's all about making a better buyer in the marketplace if there's going to be a marketplace, we need better buyers. That's right. And and, and that's the practical solution. I'm, I like, I, I, mm -hmm. I always talk about working in the middle out, right? Not, right? not picking a team or working on one extreme, but working from the middle out. If there's going to be a market, and we can acknowledge we, we don't think there should be a market, but right. if there's going to be a market, how do we make the situation better given the reality of the situation? And I, 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 I applaud you and I agree with you. <laughs> 
tell me one more time about uh, Follow the Pots. And if somebody uh, wanted to participate in this, maybe contribute to this, tell, tell me the website and um, a little bit one more time about this project. So Follow the Pots is looking for artifacts from the Dead Sea Plain sites and the series of five sites that may or may not be the cities of the plain mentioned in Genesis including Babadra, Faifa, Nak, and um, Safi, Numera. Um, we are looking for those materials around the world. So if you have a pot at your house, you should email me. Or, and no judgment, as you've just heard. Like, I'm not here to judge. I'm just trying to figure out how far and wide they've traveled. Um, or if you are a curator of a collection that has a tomb group from Babadra, please get in touch. I'm always looking for those. I was just in the Met checking out their tomb group uh, two weeks ago. Uh, and how you can uh, to you know be in touch with me if you want to donate or if you want to have further information. I'm always, I'm pretty receptive and responsive on email. So I will always get back in touch with you and tell you a bit about our story. But I just encourage you to check out the website because it's pretty robust. You can click on, you know, McCormick Seminary and then look at it. Mm -hmm. So, and we'll have the we'll have the URL here, and people if they're, if they're interested, they can uh, uh, learn more uh, by visiting it on the web. Morag Kersel, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. This has been fascinating. I learned so much, and it's always great talking to you. Well, I love to talk. Thanks, Bob. I really appreciate <laughs> the invite. As do all the people I've spoken with, and I would be nowhere without my informants. So I really have to give it out to the kindness of strangers, because really, I've still spoken to so many people, and that's how I've been able to connect some dots. So I appreciate you giving me this opportunity. Thank you. You bet. You bet. And we wish you everything the best. Thanks again. Thank you.